Hello, everyone. Today, I have Patrick Carmen here with me from Go Kids Go. Patrick is also an author and a New York Times bestselling author, in fact, and he's also a podcaster at Dad Pod. Uh, Patrick, you have uh, written over 40 novels, which is incredible, more than 5 million books in 23 countries, uh, which is so incredible. You also have spoken to over a million kids at 2,500 schools across the country. And you have a project that you've recently uh, launched called Go Kids Go, and it's a series of podcasts all kind of modeled in the Avenger style universe, which I think is super cool. And we're all about podcasting here. So welcome, Patrick. It's so great to have you. And let's dive in. Thank you, Michelle. I feel like we just covered it. You covered it all. We can just uh, <laughs> talk about tacos or I don't know. We can talk about whatever we want now. That's great. You, you got you a uh, good intro. Oh, thank you. Well, I love it. I just love what you're about. And, you know, listening to some of the podcasts with my kids in the car has been really fun. And, uh, you know, I'd love to hear kind of a little bit of the story about how Go Kids Go, Kids Go kind of came about. And, and what was your, what were, the, what, what were the beginnings of that? I would love to know how that came about because it's such a big hit now. Well, it's a great question. So, um, yeah, so this is very much a, uh, a COVID company, I would say, in that we, <laughs> I, I do a lot of touring, as you as you just mentioned. I've been to you know thousands of schools. I've been in lots of gymnasiums in public schools all over the country, and mm -hmm. I usually get out and see well over a hundred schools every every school year. And um, haven't been able to do that for a while because they won't let me in there, uh, which is a good idea. But I can't you know I can't go to schools, and I haven't been able to do that for a couple of years now. But um, when that first that first started happening, where I was kind of stuck at home. Uh, I had been wanting to do more in the audio space for a while, and I had more time on my hands than normal. And so I have two friends, one who lives in Los Angeles, which is uh, Maya Glickman, and she's a she's a Hollywood producer. And then Jennifer Clary, who lives in over near London. And the three of us cooked up this idea to create a company called Go Kid Go that is designed to bring uh, narrative podcasts to kids. So these are very much full cast uh, lots of characters. We wanted to have um, really high quality, like, you know, really good actors that really know how to make this stuff funny and fun. Because we really felt like the big win for kids was not necessarily for us to get them to learn a lot of stuff, like not like a science show so much, but just to get them to listen was kind of the, the whole win. Uh, because we know that listening is one step away from reading a book. And also kids, they get a lot of the same benefit from, li from listening to something as they would from reading something. A lot of the same, they're gonna learn vocabulary, they're gonna learn context. Uh, it's gonna just really fire up their imaginations. Um, and really importantly, it's gonna keep them off of a screen for a little while, which is a big, big thing that I know a lot of parents are really trying to just find a screen alternative. So it was kind of all those things. And we just went out and raised a little bit of money and uh, started making shows. So we've made a bunch of shows. <laughs> Yeah, I know because I had to write them all. <laughs> you wrote them all. That's amazing. So how many podcasts are there out there under Go Kids Go now? So there are, uh, there are five main shows. And then inside of those shows, we do what's called a daily. So we have like the main mm -hmm. full cast show. And then between those, we do like two or three episodes a week. That would be where we're pulling a character out of the show. And they're doing like a little monologue, kind of a fun, you know, like a riddle fest or a mathematic machine type uh, thing for kids. Um, so, but really five main shows. And as you said, uh, four of the five are in a, in a universe of shows. So uh, I, I, as a writer, just know from talking to so many kids that kids really like, um, once they get to know characters in a place, they like to go back there because mm -hmm. um, they're familiar with it and they kind of get uh, attached to the characters in the place. And so doing something that is that sort of Avenger style universe where there's one big town yeah. And all of our characters, have, you know, they have different shows, but they, you, they kind of enter, enter, you'll see, you'll, you'll see them in each other's shows. Right. And so they kind of, kids will meet them in one show and be like, oh my gosh, they have a show over there. And they, they go over to that show and they kind of move around and they feel like they're part of a whole universe and, and, uh, and a place where that all takes place. So, yeah. Oh my gosh. And I cannot pronounce the name of it. So can you share with us how, the name, the name of the universe is? The name really of the town. <laughs> so this is pretty funny, Michelle. So I, I thought, here's what's funny. I thought I came up with the name of the town all on my own, but it turns mm -hmm. out that's not true. So it's a place called Pflugerville. 
Uh, and it's it's it sounds weird because it starts with a PF, so it's Pflugerville. It's Pflugerville, <laughs> and uh, I thought I had I was like, oh, that's a funny, fun name for a place that you had set a whole bunch of shows. Well, it turns out that is an actual town in the state of Texas. Oh my gosh, <laughs> no way! <laughs> and, and it's pretty close. If you're from if you're listening to this and you're from Texas, you're like, yeah, duh, we know. Um, it's not even that small of a town. Um, and it's near Austin and I've done a lot of touring in Texas. So I'm pretty sure what happened was I probably drove by Pflugerville on the freeway multiple times and, and thought it was funny. And then thought I thought that I had actually come up with it when in fact it's, uh, it's somebody else. Um, but yeah, so that the town of Pflugerville, this, mm -hmm. we're, our fictitious version of that town is where all of our shows, uh, reside, except for, I should mention Michelle. So there's a, there's the, there's these four shows and we can talk about those. And then there's one show that's an outlier and that's R.L. Stein's uh, story club. So that oh, yeah. uh, is a, just a friend of mine, R.L. Stein, his real name is Bob. But Mr. Stein um, was uh, uh, willing to let us make his show for his podcast from. So that's one where it's, it's the same guy that makes Goosebumps. So that's more of a, I don't know, it's kind of a Twilight Zone strange. It's all the stories that are in his vault that were too weird to end up in books. That's, that's, <laughs> I love that's, it. That's, that's yeah. the idea. I grew up, I grew up reading his, his books for sure. Oh, yeah. <laughs> all sorts of crazy things. <laughs> that's awesome. Yeah. That's so great. Uh, you know, have you found now having a podcast that are specifically for kids, has it been a bit of like an education process of getting parents there and then getting their kids there? Cause podcasting is probably not something that kids would just naturally go to on their own, like say YouTube or others screen things right yeah it's a good it's a good point so so we you know part of that is we have we have it in our budget to to um to advertise on other podcasts to get to help mm -hmm. like parenting podcasts to help parents find our shows mm -hmm. but i also would say i i have a lot of librarian school librarian and school teacher friends and the trend i'm hearing uh and part of this is because of covid and part of it, mm -hmm. part of it is just because it's a trend is that um, teachers and librarians are using podcasts a lot in the school setting. So I think That's we're getting great. discovered because I'm somebody who a lot of, because I tour to a lot of schools mm -hmm. and I have lots of books in those libraries that I, I might be getting discovered and then the podcasts are getting discovered. Um, and that's kind of how, and then, it, then the parents find out about it, but it is very much, I mean, as you know, I mean, it's difficult for kids to discover a podcast. It's usually going to be the parents that do and mm -hmm. share it with their kids. But I do think it's a little bit in reverse here because I think kids are, are hearing them at school a lot of yeah. times. Yeah. And we do. So we do an event every about every week. Sometimes we'll, we'll take a few weeks out, but usually every week I do an event that's a that's a Zoom event where classes can come in and just hear me talk about the shows. And so um, we've done a bunch of those. So that's probably helped also. Oh, that's awesome. Yeah. I love it. Cause I feel like when we listen to podcasts, my kids are, um, six and nine, when we listen to podcasts it's in the car, that's our normal place for listening to podcasts, the kids podcasts. Right. And I feel like it's better than like having screens on or then like, you know, uh, listening to music on the radio anymore, too many commercials there. So the podcasts are awesome for the car. Where do you find, have you heard from parents like where, um, the kids, is it like a bedtime they're listening or where's the normal place that parents are listening with their kids? Yeah, I think one of them is the car, but I also, again, now this has changed a little bit recently, but when kids were uh, home a lot, which is when we first kind of got going, I mean, I think parents were looking for anything for their kids to do that was not, was not right. on a screen. So uh, I think a lot of parents were listening at the table and, you know, doing the, the nice thing about listening to a podcast is you can do it and you can do something else at the same time. Yes. So you can do that and, you know, do Legos or you, you know, color a picture or whatever, or, or even take a walk or, or those types of things. And I think, I think we, you know, we don't really have, we can't tell when we just know somebody's listening to the show on a, on a device. So we don't really know what they're doing, but mm -hmm. anecdotally, I would say that it seems to me that the obvious time would be, yeah, it's in the, on the commute to school or whatever it's in the morning. So I'm sure we're getting a lot of that, but I think we're getting a lot of parents just at home with kids uh, listening while they're cooking dinner. Um, going for walks, that sort of thing. I think there's a fair amount of that happening as well. So that, again, it's a really good, we, we, we've really tried hard to make shows that are not painful for parents to listen to. And, right, yeah. Yeah. So if you've no, listened to you know, them, yeah, they're nice and they're nice and uplifting and they, they're not like um, the Caillou, you know, annoying, Yeah, we try to make them funny and yeah. once in a while the jokes might go over the kids' heads and we use, you know, we try not to talk down to kids. We're like, yeah, whatever, whatever we think uh, uh, these characters would say. And so I do think we get a lot of um, co-listening, we call it, where a parent and, and, and kids are listening at the same time, probably at home. Yeah. 
That's awesome. And so for our listeners um, and readers, what would you, what's the message you'd like to, to share with the parents? Like uh, that, you know, if they're listening and they're reading this, uh, that's something that you'd like them to take away. Well, again, we're not, um, not that the, not that your kids are not going to learn anything by listening to these podcasts, because there are, there are things uh, that they might learn, but really we feel like the whole idea, and I've said this for 20 years as I've gone out and seen kids at schools, is it is such a big win for kids to actually turn pages in a book. Yes. Mm-hmm. And it's very, this is very true of, of listening to a story as well. Just getting them to listen is, is um, a big, big win because they're going to get so much out of that. Uh, again, they're not going to be staring at a screen. It's going to activate their imaginations. They're going to learn vocabulary. They're going to learn context. They're going to um, they're going to learn all kinds of stuff. And it's really uh, pretty close to what they would get out of reading a book. And in fact, if they listen to a story, chances are they're going to want to read more. That's there's a lot of data that shows that that's true. And so, you know, I would say if you're a parent and you're looking for something to do that is really healthy for kids' brains. Mm-hmm. Uh, this is, I mean, listening, it doesn't have to be our podcast, any podcasts for kids. And there, there's getting to be a lot more of them. When we started even just nine, 10 months ago, there were definitely podcasts, but there, but there weren't that many. And we're starting to see more and more good quality podcasts come into the space specifically for kids that are either story-based like most of ours, or, you know, lots of ones that are like nonfiction would be like science or math or those sorts of things. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it wasn't that long ago that, um, Apple even like rearranged the category so that there was more specific, wasn't just parenting in the kids and family section that it was specifically for kids. What made you, um, start, you've had a long journey working in kids in the, within kids, uh, whether it's writing a book or being involved in the go kids go, what, what made you get started in uh, wanting to support kids? Well, Michelle, how, how far back do we want to go here? <laughs> how much time we got here? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I know. So I'm 56. I didn't write my first book for kids until I was 33 or 34. Um, so I spent a bunch of years. Um, I was in, I, I right out of high, uh, college, I started an advertising agency in Portland, mm-hmm. Oregon. And I did that for about 10 years. And then I started a tech company. did that for a bunch of years. And I don't know. I didn't, it's not that I didn't like that kind of work. I did. I did like it. Um, but I always, I always enjoyed telling stories. I remember th- that's something I liked doing when I was a little kid. I never really, I wasn't really a writer when I was a kid and I wouldn't call myself somebody who was a bookworm when I was a kid. Mm-hmm. Um, but I did love telling jokes and telling stories and, and, and all that. So that, that part I think was, uh, part of my personality, mm-hmm. um, and somewhere along the line doing, doing all the adult work that I was doing in the creative world, like in advertising and, and technology can be very creative as well. I don't know. I just felt like I really, if I could do um, exactly what I want to do, I would love to be able to go to schools and talk with kids uh, about reading and how important it is. And I would love to write books. So I think that it took me a while to get, get to that. And then it also was a big shock that I wrote something that anyone would actually want to publish. So I think it was a, it was a, it was a big pipe dream. And then it was like, oh my gosh, they actually want to publish this book. So I guess I, I guess it, uh, I guess I'll go out and, and uh, run around. So, and it just worked out great for the last 20 years. I've been writing books and, and, um, and visiting kids at schools. And it's been really, really fun. That's awesome. Where did you get your inspiration for your first book? So my first book was actually a story that I told to my own kids. Oh, awesome. So I told it to them out loud over a course of about two months. And I had a little journal that I kept with, uh, so I put them to bed and then I would, you know, draw the maps and the places and all the sort of notes about the story that I was telling, which I was just making up. Um, <laughs> but it became big enough that I, I remember that putting them to bed one night and going, boy, this, this is a lot of material. I should think about uh, writing this down. And I just started writing, writing it into a book. And then that, that became the Land of Elyon series. Uh, which was published through Scholastic. Uh, that was the first the first series that I that I ever wrote. Yeah, yeah. That's awesome. You have to have quite the imagination, I think, to come up with what. You... Apparently, or I'm told. I think it's more that I'm very in touch with the ten, my ten year old self than that I <laughs> that I think like a ten year old. So it, the writing is actually quite easy for me because I'm just like, oh, this, well, uh, this is how I, this is how I'm uh, thinking today, just like well, a ten year old. I know the ten year olds appreciate that they have some that can relate to them. Yeah. <laughs> That is so, so great. I love it. Um, and what's been your most interesting, like spark of inspiration for anything you've done so far? 
the most interesting spark of inspiration that I've yeah. ever had. Maybe that came oh, from an unlikely place or. <laughs> hmm. It's a tough question, I know. <laughs> well, now, yeah, now I got to think about this one. Um, probably, I mean, a lot of the things that I have uh, written and even, even these, these podcasts that I came up with, a lot of that stuff does come out of things that I was into or stories that I was telling when I was a 10 year old. Mm. And I tell this to kids a lot when I go to schools and parents, you can tell this to your kids too. It's like yeah. a lot of the best ideas that you'll ever come up with uh, happen when you're like eight, nine, 10, 11, 12. You're just, you're, it's like your brain's in a different place. It's just, it's growing. Yeah, your brain is yeah. growing really fast. Your imagination yeah. is just wide open. It's you're experiencing all these new things for the first time. It's a great time to keep a little journal that doesn't have to be just page after page after page of words. It can just be drawings and experiences and things you think yeah. are funny and little stories that, that pop into your head and things that happen at school. And and if you can keep that thing later on, you'll find a solid gold in there because you'll, you have a lot of fun, uh, interesting experiences and you come up with lots of fun things when you're, when you're a kid. Um, I'm trying to think of one, like I remember, so, so here's a weird like combination of things that happened where I was reading Willy Wonka and the Chocolate Factory. I was probably 11. Mm -hmm. I was reading that and I was really into it. And we were driving, you had said earlier before we started recording, you had been down to the Oregon coast. We were driving to the Oregon coast because I live, I lived in Salem, Oregon, which was about an hour from the coast. We were always going down there and we were driving down there for a little, um, I don't know, three day weekend vacation thing. So I'm reading this book in the back seat. We get to the hotel and it was my back in those days, this would have been in the seventies. There were a lot of strange little hotels on the Oregon coast. <laughs> I bet. <laughs> it, it wasn't chain hotels. <laughs> they were just very, some of these were like, is this a is this a house or a hotel? What is this thing? And uh, I remember we went into this very odd hotel, and I thought, and I had been reading that book, and in my head I was thinking that there were secret rooms and like secret tunnels in this hotel, and if I could just like stop the elevator at just the right spot and open the doors, there'd be like a hidden like a passageway. And I had all these crazy ideas, and I was writing little notes about it, and. And then later on, I wrote a series of books for Scholastic called Floors, which is all about a hotel uh, with a bunch of hidden floors. And the story is kind of about a kid who has to kind of unlock the hotel oh, uh, cool. by finding his way and solving a mis <laughs> basically solve solving the hotel and uh, to save the hotel. So yeah, so that, that oh that's gosh. one example of the, <laughs> the strange stuff that happens. That's awesome. I'll have to get that out serious for my son. He's just reading Willy Wonka at Chocolate Factory. Oh, well, there you go. This will be that's right perfect. up his alley. Perfect. <laughs> Absolutely. Well, Patrick, I want to honor your time and thank you so, so much for spending this time with us. It's been a pleasure getting to know you and love that, you know, the mission that you're on to help uh, create more readers out there and bridging the gap through from literacy through podcasting. And I, I'm passionate about podcasting too. And so um, as I see my kids get excited about listening to podcasts, I see that there's a huge potential here and a huge future for kids and non-screen technology yeah, <laughs> and exactly. they're still able to use their imagination. So thanks so much for being here with us. Any last words you have for our audience today? You know, I would just, Michelle, I would just say, so of the, the, if you're looking for a certain kind of show, so these go kid go shows, one mm. is called Bobby wonder. That's if you have a kid who's really into superhero stuff, mm. so it's a very funny superhero show. Uh, Lucy Wow is uh, she's a builder and a maker. So if you have a kid who loves like Legos or loves to go out in the garage and make stuff, perfect show for that kind of a kid. Um, Fluesville is very much our SpongeBob show. So if you have, <laughs> you have somebody who just likes to just laugh and be goofy, that would be a good one. It's called Fluesville. And then there's one called Whale of a Tail that's in a little submarine out right outside the town of Pflugerville going on an undersea adventure and all kinds of sea creatures. So there are lot, lots of different things to choose from and a very diverse uh, casts in these things and uh, probably something that one of your kids would enjoy. And they're totally free, right, Michelle? This was great about podcasting. Right. Free. Podcasting are free. They're available. Yeah. You can listen to them 24 seven. And we love, I love that. So uh, that's so awesome, Patrick. Thank you so much uh, for all that you do. Your imagination and your creativity is really going to help our kids. And uh, I just want to uh, honor you for that. And I think it's just incredible uh, what you guys are up to. So thank you for all that you do. <laughs> well, thank you. It was a really fun time talking to you. And I, and I wish all parents the best. It's a complicated time in the world to be raising kids, not just because of COVID, but also just with 
so many things to distract them from reading. It's unbelievable. If I'd have had all the things that kids have today when I was their age, I probably, I don't, I can't imagine I ever would have read a book. So <laughs> it's a, it's a challenging time uh, to, as a parent, to keep kids reading and listening. Mm -hmm. And uh, we, we just hope that some of these things will, will be a tiny little bit of a help. Well, thank you, Patrick, for finding us. So guys, make sure you head over to Go Kids Go. You can find it on all the podcasting platforms and go check out and find a show that you think will be great for your kids. Pop it in while you're driving in on the car or pop it in while you're at home sitting around drawing and doing homework. That'll be a great way to entertain them and uh, keep them off those screens and encourage their reading. So thanks so much, Patrick. We'll talk to you again soon. All right. Thanks, Michelle.